step two is to select our carbohydrates with care. Carbohydrates are not the enemy. Blue zone intakes actually range from 50 to 80% of total calories. So the, the percent of calories in every blue zone ranges from 50 to 80% of calories. Carbohydrates from whole foods are very consistently protective to human health. If you think about it and you look at the carbohydrate content of whole foods, all of these plant foods, whether it's fruits, uh, starchy vegetables, um, legumes, uh, and non-starchy vegetables, they range from 58 to 92% of their calories from carbohydrates. So how can carbohydrates be so horrible if they are the predominant macronutrient in almost every healthy food? The only plant food that's lower in carbs is nuts and seeds. Okay. But refined carbohydrates are very bad news. Why? Well, when we refi refine a carbohydrate, and I'm using wheat, uh, wheat grain as an example, we're literally taking out the most nutritious part of the grain. Here we're taking out the bran and the germ. This is where most of the nutrients, fiber, protein, etc., are stored. And what we're left with is called endosperm, which is almost pure starch. There's a little bit of protein and a few nutrients. But in the process of taking a grain of wheat and turning it into white flour, we lose 80 to 90% of the fiber, 70 to 80% of the vitamins and minerals, and 95% of the protective phytochemicals. But nobody eats a bowl of white flour. What do we do to it first? We add fat, sugar, salt, and a bunch of food additives before we eat it. You know, there's no possible way that when we consume our carbohydrates in this form that they could possibly support human health. About 90% of the carbohydrates that people consume in, in North America are refined carbohydrates. And we wonder, you know, it, it's understandable why people have blacklisted carbohydrates. It's just they don't understand that there's a difference between unrefined and refined carbohydrates. You know, diets that are rich in refined carbohydrates are consistently linked to overeating and obesity. They adversely affect blood lipids, blood pressure, and heart disease. They adversely affect insulin sensitivity and diabetes risk. They increase our risk of GI disorders, including GI cancers. They increase non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And they increase inflammation impair Im and impair immunity. So we hear quite often that Wheat is a chronic, perfect poison. We've all seen grain brain and wheat belly. And so I just wanted to, to touch on this topic. I don't have time to go in detail, but I want you to know that we don't have serious scientific evidence against grains. The, there are very significant volumes of evidence that show that refined grains increase risk of disease, but unrefined grains are actually protective. They're associated with reduced risk of heart disease, diabetes, and many cancers as well. However, it's really important to know that even whole grains vary widely in how valuable are, they are to human health. And, and so I've developed this thing called the whole grain hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is intact whole grains. That's the grain as it's picked off the plant. Nothing added, nothing taken away. How do you make it healthier? By sprouting it. When you sprout a whole grain, you decrease anti-nutrients, you release the stored forms of nutrients, and you absolutely magnify the phytochemicals and antioxidants because phytochemicals are the things in plants that protect them against predators. They protect to allow the plant to grow. So when you start sprouting, those phytochemicals increase three, four, five hundred percent. 
So a very, very good way to improve the value of a grain is to sprout it. You also reduce the gluten content when you sprout very significantly. Next on the list would be broken whole grains, then rolled, then shredded, then ground, then flaked, and at the bottom of the list would be puffed whole grains. And so what are we doing as we go down this list? We're increasing the surface area of the grain. We're increasing the glycemic index. We're decreasing the nutritional value, exposing nutrients to air. The bottom of the list, a puffed whole grain, like brown rice cake, for example, uh, many people think is a wonderfully healthy food because it's low in calories, but the nutritional value is quite dismal, and it's absorbed more rapidly than white sugar. Okay, so we just need to understand that all whole grains are not created equal. You know, the recommended maximum intake, this is the American Heart Association, recommends men eat no more than nine teaspoons of sugar a day and women no more than six. The 2015 dietary guidelines recommend now, for the first time ever, no more than 10% of calories from sugar. It used to be 25. 25% 25 was the recommended maximum. But the average intake... 22 to 30 teaspoons of sugar a day. And everybody says, no way, nobody's going to eat 30, you know, 22 to 30 teaspoons of sugar a day. But one 8-ounce container of low-fat fruit yogurt contains 9 teaspoons of sugar on average. And that's just not, not just dairy yogurt. It's soy yogurt and coconut yogurt and almond yogurt and all sorts of yogurt that's fruit-flavored. A soda is 10 to 13 teaspoons of sugar. A slush is 28 teaspoons of sugar. You know those things kids drink in the summertime. The numbers add up very quickly. To get under the six teaspoons for women, you'd be eating no fruit yogurt, and you haven't eaten anything else all day. So it's, it's interesting. The other interesting thing is about half of our sugar comes in the form of liquid beverages, sweet beverages, sodas and uh, iced teas and uh, sports drinks and all of these sorts of things. And this is very bad news because when you drink a beverage that has calories, it doesn't register with your appetite control center the way that it would if you were consuming solid foods. So your body feels as though it's eaten no calories at all. And, uh, and so it contributes, of course, to overweight and obesity. Well, what about the sugar, the natural sugar in, in fruits? The added sugars, of course, are very consistently associated with increased disease risk, but fr uh, fruit sugar is consistently shown to be protective when it's inside the whole food. Why? Because fruit is rich in fiber. It, this slow sugar absorption, it increases satiety. It, they're loaded with antioxidants, so they reduce oxidative stress. Uh, phytochemicals in fruits have multiple disease-fighting actions, so they're also very protective. And these foods are actually really important sources of potassium and vitamin C and other nutrients. In fact, it's not that easy to design a diet that's sufficient in potassium for healthy people without fruit. However, although we're well-equipped to handle the small amounts of fructose in fruit, when we remove fructose from food and we add it to beverages and processed foods, our body's capacity to handle fructose very quickly becomes overwhelmed. It is metabolized only by liver cells. Glucose is metabolized by every cell of the body. Excess fructose is turned into fat. It's turned into something called VLDL. In the, in the bloodstream, and it's stored as fat in the liver, contributing to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So all of the adverse effects of too much sugar are magnified with fructose over glucose. And what's really interesting, if you look at the, sh the, the sugar content of various sweeteners, whether it's agave syrup or coconut sugar or honey or maple syrup or molasses, what you see is that almost all of the sugar is, is fructose and glucose. Okay? 
And, and the only sugar that's all glucose is corn syrup. If you look at something like agave syrup, 57 to 90% of the sugar is free fructose. In table sugar, half is fructose, half is glucose, but they're tied together. So in order to absorb these things, we have to split that sugar before the sugars can be absorbed. So it seems as though things with the free fructose are even more damaging than sucrose. And so you can see high fructose corn syrup has a variety of levels of free fructose, but also um, agave syrup, a lot of people think coconut sugar is, you know, very low fructose sugar, but it's only got three to nine percent, but the rest, 70 to 79 percent, is actually sucrose, which is half fructose, half glucose. So, you know, my approach to sugars has been very simple. I use them like I would use oils. So a teaspoon to flavor for culinary flavor in a dressing or something. Um, but basically, I don't use sugar as a food. Uh, really, I use, uh, if I want fruit or dried fruits, to sweeten desserts. And that's it. Uh, that's sort of a reasonable direction to go where sugar is concerned. What about the fructose in fruit? Well, just so you understand, a 20-ounce Pepsi has about 36 grams of fructose. You can see, that's just a 20-ounce. Some people get a 40-ounce. So, so you can see the amounts in fruits. It takes a lot of fruit to add up to just one soda. Okay, and, and there's great differences in fructose content of different fruits, but you can see by having a variety, you're not going to go over the top, and what is the top? We don't really know. Some experts are saying 50 grams, some say 25 grams, but I think when people are consuming it in fruit, and consuming fruit re relatively moderately throughout the day, it's not a huge issue.